Hello and welcome to the program. Today we're going to continue in our series on the weapons of our warfare. As I continue to teach from my book, Anointed for Battle, which you can get by clicking on the link. And today we're going to be looking at one of the most powerful weapons we have in our arsenal. Of course, all of them are powerful, but this is one of the most powerful. And that is the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Now we're going to start off like we did in the other teachings with our foundation scripture, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So again, the weapons we fight with are not carnal. They're not natural, not physical. They won't do you any good. The weapons we fight the enemy in his kingdom of darkness are spiritual weapons, powerful weapons. And as we looked in the previous teachings on the armor of God in the name of Jesus, we have to be dressed for battle with our armor. We have to go forth with the weapons in our arsenal like the name of Jesus. And today's teaching on the blood of Jesus. And I go into in depth in my book, Anointing for Battle. That's why I want you to get the book so you can have the full understanding. But this is the headlines. But you need to know the weapons you've been given. Because Jesus already won the war, but we have to enforce it. The church has to enforce it. We've been given superior weapons. And one of the most powerful we have is the blood of Jesus. And a lot of people don't realize that the blood, how powerful it is. I mean, just one you know, drop of his blood is powerful. So just imagine all of it. And we have been and we have authority to use it as a weapon, obviously with our words. We have to speak it in faith. We have to apply the blood. Um, in fact, the blood is what justifies us. We're justified by the blood of Jesus because when he shed his blood, he did it on purpose. He didn't spill his blood. When you spill something like a glass of milk, it's an accident. You didn't mean to do it. Jesus willingly shed his blood for you and me so that we could go free, so that we could have salvation, that we could have deliverance, and we could have healing. See, a lot of people just think it's just about salvation. That's the first step. But his blood, there's so much more to it. It's the blood of the new covenant. Think about it. The blood of the new covenant. That's why we we take communion. We take a, a, the bread in, a, as the body and the cup, which is a symbol of his blood that was shed for us. But we also have the application in the sense that we can use the blood as a weapon of our spiritual warfare. But it's all there's so much more to it than a lot of people realize. Like I said, by the blood of Jesus, we're made whole. We're healed. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We are healed. Well, now look in the New Testament. In uh, 1 Peter 2.24, 1 Peter 2.24, it says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So, so it, in Isaiah it says we are, and in uh, 1 Peter, we were healed. Why? Because it's our death. We already went to the cross. And if, he, and if we are and we were, guess what? then we don't have to put up with, with the, the lying symptoms. Oh, yeah, the symptoms are real, but they're lying against this truth that says by his stripes we are healed, by his blood. So if, if symptoms exist, you need to rise up and take authority. You have authority to use the blood as a weapon. And say, oh, no, by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed 2,000 years ago on the cross. So I'm appropriating that right now into the natural realm by faith because of what his blood has already done for me. See, under, have, see the understanding? In Colossians 1, 12 through 14, Colossians 1, 12 through 14, says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. For he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So it was by the blood that we were forgiven of our sins. But it says we have been redeemed. We have redemption through his blood. Think about it. In Psalms 102, it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So that's what we do when we are applying or pleading the blood. See, when I talk about pleading the blood, I'm talking about the legal pleading of the blood, not a begging type of plea. No, the legal pleading of the blood. It's just, just like in a, a natural courtroom scene. Uh, a person enters a plea. 
and they're stating that they're either innocent or guilty based on evidence. Well, in the spiritual courtroom, we have the evidence of what the blood has already done for us. Think about it. Jesus is, is the one that we can go to. He's our high priest. He is the one who's given us the power of attorney to use his name. He is the one who defends us. Oh, yeah. You know, and we have the evidence of what the blood has already done for us. We have the evidence of what the Holy Spirit has worked in us in the new birth. And we don't have to put up with things. So we can use the blood as a spiritual weapon against the enemy. So what? So when it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, what are you redeemed from? What are you redeemed by? Excuse me. You're redeemed by the blood. So that's what pleading the blood is. We are, are saying, you know what? This is what God says about us. This is what his blood has already done for us. So devil, back off. And when you are using the blood as a weapon in spiritual warfare, guess what? Demons have to back off. Demons and the devil, they know the power in the blood. They know that's what defeated them. So when... So when you're in spiritual warfare and in, in, in ministry of deliverance. Use the blood. Use the blood because it's a spiritual weapon. Think about it. Romans 3, 24 through 26. Romans 3, 24 through 26. It says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. Think about it. It says, through the redemption in Christ Jesus, by the propitiation by his blood through faith. See, we have faith in the blood of Jesus. He has redeemed us. So we have that, that authority to use the blood as a spiritual weapon, to apply the blood, to plead the blood. Again, the legal pleading of the blood. And also the blood... Just like in your natural body, it works within your body. Well, the blood of Jesus in the spiritual application works within the body of Christ. I mean, those outside of the body can't use it. But those of us who are born again, walking in our covenant, the blood covenant, we can use the blood as a weapon against the forces of darkness. So again, just like you're in the natural body, it works within your body. And if it's outside your body, it's not going to work. Well, the blood of Jesus works within the body of Christ. See, we have such a, a superior weapon. Superior weapons than what the enemy has. See, all the devil, the devil can do is throw darts of, of lies and fear and deception. But we have the blood and all the other weapons that you're going to see on these programs and in my book, Anointed for Battle. But we need to understand this, that we can apply the blood. See, we can apply the blood as as a uh, healing salve. Think about it. Um, uh, if you uh, have a, a broken bone, if you have a cut, if you have a wound, you can use the blood. By, with your words, by applying the blood as a healing salve, by putting a cast of the blood around that wound and watching the God's divine healing flow into it. Think about it. There's so much more understanding, deeper revelation that we have of the blood that people don't, don't even realize because they limit it. Just, you know, okay, well, Jesus shed his blood and, and I, I received salvation. But they forget about healing. They forget about deliverance. They forget about spiritual warfare. This blood is more powerful than anything you can imagine. It is, is, it is like um, a kryptonite to the enemy. When he sees the blood, when he sees the blood that you've spoken forth in faith, that you've applied to, to your property, and I encourage people, I talk about that in the book, you need to draw a bloodline around your property, around your home, and you need to, just like you know, you anoint your home with oil, it's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Well, we need to, with our words, of course, we need to apply and plead the blood over our properties. Draw that bloodline. Put up the barrier wall of the blood so that... That when the enemy tries to come and trespass on your property and what concerns you, guess what? He has to back up. That's just like slamming the door in his face. It's a no trespassing sign for the enemy and his cohorts that they can't come here. Why? Because you've applied the blood. Put the blood over your doorpost, over your windows. You know, plead the blood of Jesus over your children, over your family, over your car, over your finances. Because when you do, guess what? The foul spirits can't, can't, can't get past that bloodline because there's power in the blood. 1 John 1, 7. There's so many scriptures about the blood. And, and I don't get into all of them this, in this, this teaching here, this the headline, but you get the book and I go into in depth on these weapons of warfare that we've been given. Uh, 1 John 1, 7 excuse me, says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. See, there's a cleansing agent in the blood. From sin, absolutely, but not. But that means also 
any type of destruction that the enemy would try to send against you. But we have to we have to walk in the light. See, there's the cause and effect. We can't just, you know, open the door to darkness and then say, oh, Lord, you know, uh, let your blood cover me. You know, let your protection be upon me. No, we have to do our part by being obedient to the Lord, by walking in fellowship and intimacy with him, walking and staying in the light of this word. And when we do, guess what? There's a safety in God's word. There's a safety in his presence. And he will have his, and his blood will cover you. It says his blood will cleanse us from all sin. And believe me, Satan's destructive darts are sinful. They're not, they're not meant for your good, but you can rise up and say, yes, I have the weapon of warfare, the weapons of warfare that are mighty in God to pull down strongholds, to cast down arguments and high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. We have to bring these things captive. We have to take our authority. Jesus gave us the power of attorney to use his name, and we can use his blood as a spiritual weapon. Obviously, we don't have his, his physical blood. We, we use it with our words in faith. We apply it. We speak it. We plead the blood. Again, it's not begging God to do something. It's, it's, it's just speaking forth what he already said that is ours because of, of our inheritance in Christ, because of our righteousness in him. Obviously not in ourselves, but in him, by his blood. We are justified. We are made whole. We are healed. We are delivered by the blood. And we have the power of attorney to use his name and to go forth with the weapons that God has given us to keep the enemy at bay, to keep him under our feet where he belongs. In Hebrews 13, 20 through 21, the Bible says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Notice it says, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. See, this blood is an everlasting covenant. It's a covenant of blood. We have a bloody Christianity. So I, can under, I cannot understand why so many churches and ministries want to leave out songs that talk about the blood. No, you need to sing about the blood, what it's done for you, what it continues to do for you, how it defeated the enemy when Jesus willingly shed his blood. Think about it. He shed his blood for you and me. And now we have that, that authority to use that blood and say, oh, no, devil, get out of my face. You need to, with your words, throw the blood in the devil's face. And guess what? He'll back off because he knows the power in the blood. Well, we as Christians better know the power in the blood. We better know that it's a weapon that we can use. It's so mighty. In Revelation 12, 11, a very familiar scripture, but I wonder if people really know the depth of it. 12, 11, Revelation says, and they overcame him, that's past tense, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Think about it, that's double ammunition. The blood and our testimony. In fact, the word of our testimony should be what the blood has done for us and continues to do. See, a lot of people just apply that to your, just your personal testimony of you know, being delivered from drugs or alcohol, like that. And that's only a portion of it. But the, what this is really... The deeper understanding, the deeper underpinnings of, underpinnings of this is the testimony of what the blood is doing, has done, is doing, and will continue to do in your life. Guess what? That's going to be what's going to put a black eye on the devil. That's what's going to keep him out of your business. When you start decreeing and declaring, again, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I've been redeemed from the hand of the enemy by the blood. They overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimony. My testimony is the blood of Jesus has set me free. The blood of Jesus has, 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 has wrought, wrought me salvation, healing, deliverance, prosperity, and a place of safety. Think about it. So there's so much more to it. So don't just limit it to one thing. The blood is powerful, and it's a weapon you've been given. You've been anointed for battle, absolutely. And one of the weapons you have is the blood. So start using it. Don't just sit back and... and and, and in my, take the devil's garbage. Don't let him browbeat you. Don't let him hit, uh, put that little yo-yo in front of you to see if you're going to take his bait. No, refuse the bait of Satan and start walking in the truth of God's word. God's word, his name, his blood, his Holy Spirit. These are weapons you've been given. So start using them. And don't you know, cringe back in fear. No, God didn't give you a spirit of fear. He gave you love, power, and a sound mind. He's given you his words and these weapons. Now you need to go forth and plunder the devil's camp. Don't allow anything or anyone to talk you out of what Jesus already paid for on the cross. You secure it. You don't allow anything to come against it. 
Because if you do, guess what? Then you're going to be putty in the devil's hand, and he's going to walk all over you. He's going to steal your finances, your family, everything. But don't allow him to. You take authority. Throw the blood in his face because there's power in the blood. Think about it. In 1 John 5, 8. 1 John 5, 8. The Bible says, And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. See, there's unity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's one God in three persons. Think about it. In, in fact, let me just read the verse before that. There are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. So there's agreement. What well, we have to come into agreement, we're the body of Christ. We have to agree with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but also agree that his blood is powerful. And when we start speaking it forth, guess what? We're going to see things change. We're going to see demons flee. We're going to see um, uh, horrible situations, you know, accidents that are waiting to happen that the enemy is aroused for you. They're going to be, they're going to be of no effect. Why? Because you rise up and you start pleading the blood. You start applying the blood. You need to wake up every day, and as you put on your armor, and as you start, you know, having your time of prayer and intimacy with the Lord, you also need to plead the blood of Jesus daily, because you don't know what's out there waiting to try to trip you up. The enemy, you know, has a plan for you. Well, bless God, we have God's plan, but the devil has a plan, and he wants you to be destroyed. He has a plan of destruction, but don't give him any uh, leeway, because if you give the devil an inch, then he becomes a ruler in your life. I say this all the time, but it's the truth. But don't give them an inch. Don't have any chinks in your armor. Know your weapons. Start using them. Like I said, draw the bloodline around your property, around your car. If you're going on a trip uh, over your car, over the airplane, you know, plead the blood. Guess what? It's a divine protection. And you can be rest assured in faith. Guess what? Everything's going to be fine. So don't, don't, don't think that it's just about, okay, well, the blood is only about salvation in the sense of being saved from hell. Well, that, that, that's just the, a, a little portion of it. There's so much more to it, and we need to know it, and we need to start walking in it, applying it. I go into detail in my book. That's why I want you to get the book so you can have that resource, so you can study it. Get your Bible and start seeing the scriptures that I have in there and start just meditating in them, studying them, and apply them. In Hebrews 12, 23 and 24, It says, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Think about it. It says we are uh, the, the church of the firstborn. But notice this is 24, to Jesus, who is the mediator of the new covenant. See, we have a new covenant based upon better promises. On the Old Covenant, they had the blood of bulls and goats, and it was just a stopgap. It, 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 it was just a covering, but that was just a foreshadowing of what we have today in the New Covenant. We have the very blood of Jesus. And notice it says it speaks better things than that of Abel. Well, guess what? The blood of Jesus speaks life. Now, the blood of Abel represents death. It speaks death, but the blood of Jesus represents life, life more abundantly. And the blood of Jesus has a voice. The blood of Jesus is warm, it's alive, it's active. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not dead, it's not just you know dried up and gone away. No, it's eternal. And he has given that blood to us. It speaks a better word than that of Abel. Because like I said, Abel it represents death. But we have life in the blood of Jesus. In Leviticus 17, it talks about that life is in the blood, and, and it's been given as an atonement for us. He 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 shed it for us. Like I said, under the Old Covenant, they had the blood of bulls and goats. It was just a foreshadowing. But we don't have the blood of animals today. We have the blood of Jesus. We have the very blood of Jesus. In fact, when you were born again, you, you received a new spiritual DNA. You have the blood of Jesus coursing through your veins. You, you are a royal priesthood, a chosen people to God. His blood flows through you. So start rising up and acting like a child of the Most High God and start using your authority in Jesus' name. 1 Peter 1. 18 and 19. It says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold 
from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, to the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. There's no blemish. There's no spot. There's nothing defiling about the blood. It's perfect. See, so we weren't redeemed with corruptible things like silver gold. I mean, those things that are going to fade away, things that are going to tarnish, things that are not going to be lasting. But we've been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. See, it's precious. So don't, don't, don't ever take the blood lightly. Don't ever speak it forth lightly. It's precious. It cost him his life. But he did it for you and me. And now that we are born again, we have this, this beautiful blood as a weapon. We can plead the blood. We can apply the blood. We can use the blood, like I said, as a, a, a cast, a healing salve over a broken bone, over an injury. And that healing of his blood that we speak forth in faith will come into our bodies to make us whole. There's so much more. And I, I just can't understand why people just, you know, they want to take the blood out of something. They want to just not talk about this. They think, it, they think it's gross or something. No, the blood is precious. And it's something that we need to talk about. We need to use it as a weapon. We need to sing it in our songs because there's power in the blood. Like the old song goes, goes there's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. And it's the truth. But we need to start using this in our understanding in spiritual warfare. Acts 20, verse 28. says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. His own blood. Not the blood of bulls and goats. No, he purchased the church, us, the body of Christ. We've been purchased with the blood. So why are we sitting back in defeat? Why are we sitting back in a, a, a lackadaisical comfort zone and allow the enemy to just to walk all over us when we've been purchased with this blood that not only saves us, heals us, and delivers us, but also keeps us in that place of safety when we are going forth into spiritual battle? Think about it. There's so much more to this, and we need to understand it. Ephesians 2.13. Ephesians 2.13. says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It says, those of us have been far. I mean, those who, who were not a part of the body, those who were dying and on their way to hell, guess what? Now that they've been born again, think about it, whether Jew or Gentile, we all, each one has to come to Christ. It says you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now we have been brought near. We're not far off. We are members of his body, bone is the bone, flesh of his flesh. It's because of what the blood has already done for us and what continues to do for us. Think about it. In uh, Romans 5, 8 and 9, Romans 5, 8 and 9. It says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Think about it. Well, God's going to pour out his wrath during the second part of the tribulation. So we know that we're not going to be here for that because the rapture is free tribulation because he reserves wrath for his enemies. And because we've been justified by his blood, that means it's just as if we've never sinned, even though we did sin. We've been justified. We've been made right with him through his blood. And, and because we accept, accepted him, the sacrifice, we accepted the death, burial, and resurrection, and we received his Holy Spirit. Guess what? We've been saved from wrath. So look what the blood does. It saves us from the wrath to come. It saves us from having to go through the tribulation. But so many people are, are going to reject the knowledge of his truth. They're going to reject the blood. They're going to reject it. And guess what? And they're going to have to go through all the horrors that are coming. And believe me, they're not going to be a Sunday picnic. So you need to start choosing, first of all, yes, to be saved and to receive the blood of Jesus by faith. Then after you have been born again, now you have a spiritual weapon that you can use to keep you in that place of safety, to keep you in that place of divine protection, to keep you in that place of under the shadow of the Most High, when you abide in his secret place. A lot of people, they don't want to abide. They, oh, they might visit, but God's not looking for a visitation. He's looking for a habitation. But for the first step is you're going to have to be born again. Absolutely. And once you have been born again, and you're a member of the body of Christ, and now you have this understanding of who you are in Christ, and the weapons you've been given, now go forth and walk in your authority. 
Don't allow the devil to run roughshod over you. No, you run roughshod over him. You have authority. He's not your enemy. He's your enemy. The devil is your enemy. Now take authority and throw the blood in his face. Say, I have overcome you, devil, by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. My testimony is what this blood has done for me and continues to do. So you have to have that tenacity. You have to be bold in the faith, steadfast in the faith. In the book of Exodus, I talked about earlier about how under the old covenant they had, you know, the blood of bulls and goats. Well, we're going to look at this so you have an understanding so we can put it in our application, our new covenant application. In Exodus 12, uh, verse 13, and then 21 through 24. It says, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Then 21 goes, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that's in the basin and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that's in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the, ho out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. Well, again, under the old covenant, the Israelites, they had the blood of bulls and goats. And when they would take the blood of bulls and goats and apply it over the doorpost of their home, over the lintels, the destroyer couldn't come through. And, and God, when he saw the blood, he passed over. Well, in our aspect in the new covenant, for this is a type and foreshadowing of the blood we have now, when we plead or apply the blood to the doorpost of our home, to our properties, guess what? The destroyer, who is Satan, can't come through. He can't get past that bloodline. Those foul spirits can't come past the bloodline. When they see that blood, guess what? They, have, they can't go any further. Think about it. So we see that we see the foreshadowing of this. We see... The understanding in our covenant today that that um uh, of course then you know it's talking about their you know the Egyptians and stuff but see our enemy is the devil and he wants to kill steal and destroy but we have a powerful weapon that will destroy his kingdom that's the blood so when we apply the blood to the doorpost of our home when we apply the blood over our car over our family over everything that concerns us guess what when that devil sees that blood, he backs off. Like I said, it's kryptonite to him. He, 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 he can't stand the blood. That's why we need to sing about the blood. We need to plead the blood, apply the blood, speak the blood in faith. And guess what? The devil and his demons will back off because they know the power in the blood. Like I said, it's illegal pleading the blood, just like I said earlier. And you're in a, a courtroom. You're, 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 you're making a plea stating whether you're guilty or innocent based on the evidence that's presented. Well, in the spiritual courtroom of heaven, guess what? We have the evidence that the blood has already spoken for us. I plead innocent by the blood. That's what you need to do. And then you start, hey, hey devil, get out of my business. I'm innocent because Jesus already imputed his righteousness to me. I had none of my own, but he gave me his righteousness. I'm righteous and justified by the blood. So devil, demon, back off. So this is what I want you to understand. So please get this book. Anointed for battle. This is an end time manual for spiritual warfare and for deliverance and to help you to understand your authority in Christ. And these teachings like in this program are just the headlines. If you get in here, I go into every one of the weapons. We're going to look on the when we, we get into this uh, series even deeper. Like I said, we've already looked at some. We're going to continue. There's many of them. And if you get this book, go to the link on this description page, click on the link, and you can go to Amazon and get this book, Anointed for Battle. It will help you. Like I said, it's backed up by extensive scripture so that you can see it in the word. Not just what I say, but the word of God so that you can see the scriptures, you can meditate on, you can study them, and you can start putting them into practice. So please click the link and get this book, Anointed for Battle, so that you can go forth and continue to enforce the war that Jesus already won. So please take this seriously. There's power in the blood. More power than anything you could ever even imagine. And there's no limits to it. And when you start knowing your authority, guess what? The devil's going to back off. Oh, yeah, he's going to try to come again to see if you'll take his faith. But guess what? You can rise up again steadfast in the faith and know that 
because you are walking in your authority and you're using the weapons of warfare that will pull down strongholds, guess what? There ain't nothing you can accomplish because of what the blood has already done for you and what it continues to do. So please, get this, this book, get these teach, teachings and start walking in your authority and, and win it spiritual warfare every single time. Amen? And as always, remember that the word of God stands forever. Amen.